I would want to say, and I, I say this kindly, they are anti-intellectual intellectuals. They are anti-intellectual intellectuals. Is Dr. Dennis McDonald off his rocker? Is his Greek mimesis, Greek imitation in the New Testament, absurd, silly, should be laughed off, has zero evidence in support of it? Here's a little interview I got to do when Dennis McDonald gave me a ride while we were in California recently doing a course recordings for Karakuni Egyptologist and in-person recordings with Dr. Richard C. Miller. Join the Patreon if you want those early access with Richard C. Miller, as over the unfolding weeks I will edit and put them up. However, I ask him, check out this interview that these four Christian apologists over at Testify, including Tim McGrew, Jonathan McClatchy, Stephen Boyce, and Eric Manning, what they say about your work. Now, heads up, we are going to do a thorough response to the stream, picking apart all the errors that are seen in this episode. But for now, here is his response. Professor Dennis R. McDonald, Harvard graduate, Claremont professor, you know, got a patch on the back a little. Um, your work surrounding mimesis or imitation of Greek literature within the New Testament has been, uh, for me, Eureka, groundbreaking, quite an impressive thing you've done. Are you right on everything? I, don't, I could turn it to you and you could answer and say, probably not. Okay, no. there you go. But there's something about what you do. There's something about your work that just resonates as true. I mean, one thing I just want to say is, where did this take off? Christianity did not flourish in Palestinian extreme Orthodox Judaism. No, it flourished among Gentiles, among non-Jews, and it grew, and it was like a rapid fire they couldn't put out, and they tried. So I want to start with what your two cents are pertaining to the response video. The gentlemen that were on the screen are Tim McGrew, who I would say out of the four, would be considered the most qualified in terms of academics research. He is more of a philosopher and his research is in epistemological stuff. You have um, uh, Boise, I think it's Boise on the top right. Then you have Jonathan McClatchy. Then you have my friend Eric Manning. He's just a YouTuber who's into this stuff. Um, they did the response to you and really think it's silly. It's ridiculous. It's funny. It's weak. There's nothing to it. So we're going to have to do a thorough picket piece by piece video remotely at some point. Dennis, tell me your thoughts. Well, first of all, I want to thank them for giving attention to my work and to taking it seriously, even though they disagree with it. I don't think they think they treat it fairly, but um, and we'll talk about that. But I want to talk about I, uh, the apologists as a rhetorical sociological phenomenon. Almost all religions have apologists of some kind, and they are the defenders of the in-group and its values and its canonical texts and its rituals, and they're embarrassed sometimes by commensality, that is, that you have similarities in other religions. Um, then in order to identify the values of the in-group, they often stereotype the out-groups. And so the out-groups then are whatever. So for Muslims, they may be Christians or Jews or atheists or something like that. Now, in these groups, then you have self-designated intellectuals that try to fortify the, in, the values and behaviors and traditions of the in-group. And to do so, they often stereotype and actually name call the outsider. Well, I find with these Christian apologists, I'm the outsider. And so then I get uh, accused of being weird and baseless and flippant and um, uh, hilarious and crazy sometimes. Well, that's just a part of the rhetoric. So the, the issue is that we have to get back from the rhetoric to the texts. Now, I'm um, a scholar of early Christian narrative primarily, but I do so as a classicist and as a humanist. 
And it's important to start with these texts as literature and not presuppose that they're historical reporting, not presuppose that they have particular sources, but to understand what they're like as literature. Now, we know that the Gospels are unusual kinds of narratives, but they do have analogies in the ancient world. Some of the analogies are Jewish. Some of them are Greco-Roman. And I'll get to, uh, to set how, it, how a scholar makes sense about similarities between one kind of literature and another. But one of the things that happens in the video that you're talking about is over and over and over again, these people claim that um, the New Testament is not interested in the Greco-Roman world. It's only interested in Judaism. Judaism was not interested in the Greco-Roman world. And that is just patently false. That cannot stand. Uh, what about Philo? What about Josephus? What about the Testament of Abraham? What about Third Maccabees? What about Tobit? And the list goes on. Now, that's not to say that Jews were all happy about uh, Greco-Roman paganism and the Homeric epics, but the way you engage th those texts and those traditions is not to ignore them, but to borrow from them, to transform them. And this is another thing that bothers me about this, um, uh, this tape, that, uh, the, the podcast. Mimesis, imitation, is not stealing. And that word stealing happened about four times in this uh, relatively short podcast. Stephen Boyce was the one, I think, that said it first in that. But. That's right. Uh, but he said it several times. Okay. It is not stealing. It is transformation. Uh, the same way that you would say, would you say that Virgil is stealing from Homer when he writes uh, the Aeneid? Right. No, he's transforming it. He's transforming it for a particular reason. So um, you can say that Jews and Christians were engaging Hellenism by transforming their mythologies to say that Moses or Jesus or Paul or whomever is superior. Now, another criticism that um, these apologists have, and I, I think I'm wandering away from uh, social identity theory, but we'll get back to it, I guess. Uh, another uh, thing that they emphasize is um, that the I qualify differences as parallels. And of course, there are going to be differences because these authors are engaging Hellenism and trying to transform it. Um, so uh, not all differences are similarities, to be sure, but there are strategic ones. The image I like to use is a feminist friend of my family, when my daughter was young, gave her a, a, a book called Sleeping Ugly, as opposed to Sleeping Beauty. So that is a transformative variation that is a parallel in a way. And you have examples of this, the death of Hector. Hector dies and stays in his tomb. Jesus dies similarly and rises from the dead. But both deaths bring the, uh, the destruction of great cities. Right. So... Um, the other piece that is missing entirely in this discussion is a discussion of criteria to determine whether you have um, uh, imitation or not. And of course, they would not deny that you have imitations of the Hebrew Bible with the stories of uh, Elijah or Joseph or, um, or Moses or David or so on. But they insist that you don't have imitations like that of the most dominant literature that we have from, the, from antiquity. Now get this, for literary papyri that we have from 200 AD to 200 uh, BC uh, to 200 uh, BCE to uh, 200 uh, CE, um, we have five fragments of the Septuagint we have over 600 of Homer. 
Now, which text do you think people are going to be more familiar with than they're, when they're reading the Gospels? So I, I want to poke in here just to give what you're doing right now is you're setting up a template. You're setting up a foundation in which anyone who's going to take this seriously, as Richard C. Miller, I just visited, who was a student of yours, um, said quite well the way he said it is he said, I want to reverse this onto the apologist. I want them to do a little homework because it seems, Dennis, you're doing all this homework. And, and it's a frustrating battle because they have not studied what you have. They have not read what you have. They are not aware of how powerful the Greek antecedents were in a world where Greek literature is writing in the Mediterranean. So I want to point out something that I think is powerful, he said. And he flipped it. And I want your comment. He said... I want them to look in Greek literature across the world in the time. Let's just say 200 BCE to 200 AD. Find Greek writings, Greek literature that is not imitating, that is not playing with Homer or Odyssey or Iliad or even Virgil's Aeneid, which is Latin. Show me, get me a list of books. Show me a plethora of it where it's not doing this. And then you might find exceptions. There are exceptions always, but it's not the rule. And the rule is New Testament gospels written in Koine. They act like this. They make the comment that Koine is like this so different than Homer. And don't get me wrong. It is a different kind of Greek. But that's like saying, well, let me see if there's any other Koine Greek written around the first century. Are they imitating Homer? What do we do then? Are we going to act like, well... They couldn't do it. So comment on that as you're building up the framework of... Well, I appreciate your comments and I appreciate Richard's, but I would uh, come at it somewhat differently. Okay. I would uh, talk about Quintilian, who was a great rhetorician of the first century in Rome, but he taught Greek and Latin students. And he was aware of the importance of mimesis, but also of inventio, that is invention. So that, yes, you would have models, but then you would invent things and you'd make them new. And one way to avoid plagiarism is to imitate multiple models. So he would say every form, and this is what he says, every form of eloquence owes something to the Homeric epics. Because there you have narrative, there you have speeches, there you have pathetic deaths, there you have farewells, there you have battle scenes, and so on. But not everybody is going to write a narrative. So if you want to do a philosophical treatise, perhaps you should imitate Plato, not Homer. Or maybe you should um, imitate Cicero, not Homer. Or if you're doing a declamation, maybe you need to have uh, um, uh, Lysias or Demosthenes as your model. So it's not that Homer is everywhere. It's that mimesis is a primary way that people were taught to, te to, to write. Mm -hmm. And when they wrote, they would often use more than one model, like a bee that is collecting pollen from several flowers to create honey. But here's my challenge um, to these people. You can't simply say that because you don't like a parallel, let's say, in the Acts of the Apostles, um, you, that you can say then it's a historical reportage. What I would say is, show me stories that come out of the culture that um, you think are better models for the story of Elpenor, let's say, or Eutychus, let's say, um, than the story of Elpenor in the Odyssey. Now, central to mimesis criticism, as I construe it, are seven criteria that are not mentioned at all in this video. And to the first two have to do with the popularity of the model, that is, its accessibility and its analogous imitations. There is no document in antiquity that was more popular than the Iliad, and in second place was the Odyssey, and in the Roman world, it was Virgil, Virgil's Aeneid. Now, those are not a part of the landscape in biblical scholarship, and it certainly isn't among these apologists. The next, um, the, the, then you have uh, analogy, 
uh, analogous imitations, of course, Virgil and Lucian and others are imitating it widely. The next criteria are the density of the parallels, the sequence of the parallels, and if they're distinctive, that is that the author is flagging a connection. Another is distinctive traits. But uh, the last one that I love is recognition by ancient authors. And we have lots of examples, Derek, of people who recognized that Mark, for example, was imitating Homer or that, um, or that Luke was. So these criteria for determining mimesis are entirely absent. So the default is for these people, if you can't show a plausible literary analogy, they must be historical reportage. That is not how ancient literature worked, I'm sorry to say. So I want to comment on that because what I know, and you're not engaged in seeing what the people who are on the screen uh, do more often than not is just to be frank, my perception, I'm going to keep my opinion. If I'm wrong about this, then, then correct me if I'm wrong. That is, they need this. They need this to be history. Let me just flip the coin for a second, Dennis. Let's pretend these are histories. I'm going to go so far as to say they're eyewitness reportage. Let's just go all the way. You still, if you granted that, would still be able to walk away and go, yeah, eyewitness reportage. How many eyewitness reportages in the world where people get things wrong or they want some of their wishful thinking or they thought they saw something and then they tell you, oh, yeah, it was the resurrected. The point is, it still wouldn't be reliable. It still wouldn't be trustworthy if we gave them that. But they need that. They are called maximalist. They argue against what are called the minimal historical criteria where they try to argue for, well, most scholars think Jesus, you know, was crucified. We can all agree. Most scholars think that there were eyewitnesses in 1 Corinthians 15 that said that they saw the resurrected Lord. We can all agree that at least they believed that. And like the list goes on. They argue against those people like Mike Lacona. They want to say the Gospels are reliable historical data about what actually happened and that you should trust them. Therefore, faith. Okay. So I want to start with saying they need these to be historical, which is why your position is threatening to their conclusions. Actually, I'm not going to say their conclusions because I think their conclusions are where they start. That's exactly right. They start with their conclusion. Uh, I would want to say, and I, I say this kindly, they are anti-intellectual intellectuals. They are anti-intellectual intellectuals. They are smart. They are learned. They work hard. They have great memories. I'm not arguing against their intelligence. I'm arguing against their judgment and their inability to have critical judgment that required, is required by, um, uh, by being an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think there probably is historical information in the Acts of the Apostles, for example. And I think largely it's because they have a collection of Paul's epistles. But even so, you still have to argue with what kind of book is the Acts of the Apostles. Why does it, like the Aeneid, end up in Rome with the, uh, the, the merging of Jews and, um, and Gentiles, the same way that, the, that Virgil ends with the Italians and the Trojans getting together? Why is it that you have a shipwreck story that takes you to uh, Rome? Why is it that you have stories of people, uh, of uh, the, uh, of, uh, uh, Elpenor and others. I could go on and on, and I've written a, a lot about it in the synopses of uh, Epic Tragedy in the Gospels. In fact, Volume 2 is all about the Acts of the Apostles. So uh, I agree with you that one can grant historical information, but that doesn't mean it's true, but it also does not explain the literary characteristics of these texts, and you've got to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, so there's some things I think we should roll back a little. You brought up your criteria. I don't want to get into that there here now. We can probably do that when we review the actual live. And that video is an hour and 41 minutes, which means when we go live, Dennis, we're going to have to have our coffee or tea or whatever, because I think we need to really, really bring it uh, and okay. pick apart some of the stuff. So the first 
defense is how Jewish all of this is, is what I hear. And this is meaning how non-Gentile, non-Greek, non-Roman they were trying to be. This is Palestinian Jews at its outset. The original Christians were Jews. And here's the thing. We don't disagree. <laughs> this is why it's like, okay, but they're trying to set that up to assume like their whole mission and goal is to be holy, separate from any. They, they, they're, they're kosher from Greek and Roman world. And we have several scholars. Could tell Bertolo I, I've interviewed and in, her book is called Jews and the Roman Rivals. And you want to know what that book is about? She builds up from the very outset of Hebrew scripture all the way to the Roman Empire. Pagan Rome. I'm going to use the word pagan. I hate using it because it's a derogative. But pagan Rome before it was Christian, or, or let me use it another way, polytheistic Rome versus uh, Christianity how and the Jews of the time, how much impact did polytheistic Rome before it converted have on Jews? She documents so much. And then you see its influence in the Mishnah, which Tim McGrew actually points out, well, uh, cursed is the person who teaches their son Greek. You could see a distaste toward Greek ideas later, but that's also like assuming Rabbi Tovia Singer, who I've had on my show before, is a representative of what actual Jews were in the first century. You've got Mishnaic Judaism over time. That is not the same thing as what that's we're exactly seeing here. Right. Uh, we're talking about Hellenistic Judaism. Anyway, um, feel free to take us, but I felt like that apologetic is what I see over and over from apologists who are critiquing your work, Richard C. Miller's, Robin Faith Walsh, and they all want to say, let's look for antecedents that are only in the Jewish literature. When we talked about the ascension of Jesus in Acts 1, I saw the critique in an article against Richard. They went, all right, well, why not Elijah? And it's like they want, they have to have it because they're afraid of touching something that's non-kosher. The closest, even Dell Allison Jr. said, Romulus is the closest antecedent. But guess what? Tim McGrew and Lydia McGrew, Tim McGrew was on that live stream. They make public, Jonathan McClatchy publicly say he is not a Christian. Del C. Allison Jr. is not a Christian. That's how far into the fundamentalism these people are working. They're calling other Christians non-Christians. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah, it's awful. It is awful. So I'm kind of taking the gloves off with you here, but... Uh, well, well, what about Josephus? Josephus is writing his antiquities. He's a great fan of the Jewish Bible. He's trying to make it available to Greeks. When he gets to certain episodes in the Bible's thin... He fills it in by imitating Homer. Now, tell me that Josephus is not a faithful Jew. And tell me that he's not imitating Homer. And I, I'll give you a dozen examples of where he is. Why does Philo say that Moses had a Greek education? Uh, uh, take a look at the, the, uh, the life of, Philo, uh, uh, of Moses in Philo. Uh, I mean, to, to say that early Christianity came out of a purely rabbinic Judaism is really nonsense. Into the story. No, I'm just <laughs> so um, I'm with you. Um, that's why I think it took off so well in the Roman Empire among non-Jews. This it just seems to so clearly point that direction. What are some other examples? Because I only watched seven minutes at the outset, and I knew, and I popped in at the end, almost was going to make a funny joke. But seven minutes in, and I already saw what they were trying to do is say, this guy's crazy, technically. Your theory, your position is nuts. It is only Jewish, and they wanted nothing to do with the Greek world. Is there anything along the stream, because you watched it, you want to discuss? Um, it, there is. They, one of the things that is frustrating is that they'll take an example, and then they'll deconstruct the example, and they'll ignore evidence that is not congenial to them. And I'll give you two bright, brief examples. One I mentioned earlier is the story of Eutychus in the Acts of the Apostles. They don't mention that his name is Lucky. And Lucky dies, but is raised back to life. They don't mention, they, they scoff that um, the, he was in Troas. And uh, that actually is ancient Troy. 
Uh, Julius Caesar once considered moving the Roman, uh, the Roman center back to Troas in order to uh, claim the legacy of ancient Trojans, such wow. as you have in the Aeneid. Um, you, they did not mention, uh, both um, Elpenor um, dies at, uh, is buried at dawn amid great sorrow, and Elpenor is raised back to life at dawn. Well, they say you can't include that because it's a difference. But it's a strategic difference. One person dies and the other, the, the Christian, Paul can raise somebody back to life. And there are just so many examples like that where they can take details, deconstruct them, um, then omit things that, um, that aren't congenial. And therefore, because you don't have a literary model, it's got to be historical reportage. Well, what is the rationality of that? Another example is the uh, death of Jesus and the death of Hector. The parallels are remarkable. But um, Stephen, in, in this uh, uh, business, mm -hmm. uh, took a look at them and he said, well, you, both Jesus and Hector drink mixed wine, but they're mixed with different things. And one is medicinal and one is um, uh, to, uh, to take care of pain. Well, then there's no parallel. I mean, enough there's said, no, obviously. Yeah, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> or that um, Jesus could not be uh, saying, my God, my God, you have forsaken me, the same way that Hector says that uh, Deiphobus, and, uh, uh, whom he thought was his, his brother, has abandoned him, that is, Apollo had abandoned him. Um, so he w says, basically, my gods have abandoned me. Um, so that's not a parallel. Right. So you, you can deconstruct all these parallels. Some of them are strategic differences, such as Hector dies and stays in the tomb and Jesus rises from the dead. Well, that can't be a parallel, can it? Right. It's because it's a strategic difference. And I think it is possible if you know the truth, as they seem to think they do, and then to see a challenge at it, to peck away, peck away, peck away, and to deconstruct um, the parallels that are, in my view, really quite compelling, and they match the criteria of Nemesis criticism, and then you can deduce, well, because you don't have the model, it must be historically true. Well, let's be honest, right? Most scholars see what's going on in Mark. Let's, let's play a little game here with antecedents with the Jewish world and show that they're not actual antecedents. And I'll give you an example. Jesus is on a mountain um, just like Moses is on a mountain. And, and what ends up happening is his face shone. And Moses' face shone. But because Jesus' garments also shone, um, this is not mimetically borrowing from Moses. In fact, we should start deconstructing using the same methodology that they are to show that the Gospels are not actually mimetically drawing from the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days fasting. Show me where Satan in the wilderness with Moses is tempting him. He's not. I don't see it, therefore it's not a parallel because it's not identical. And if there isn't an identical actual antecedent, then we should honestly throw it out and stop saying Jesus is the new Moses. Sure, he gives new laws, but come on, it's not Moses. And because there's differences, there's no mimesis taking place between Elijah or Moses or David or Joseph because Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver by his brother Judah that, you know, Judas selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver has no, there's nothing to any of this stuff. Let's stop playing this game. I mean, if we used their technique, no, that's right. we yeah. could find a way to divorce it from the scriptures, yeah. other than the part where it says, it is written. But that's just a quote about the scripture. There's no mimesis to Hebrew scripture going on here whatsoever. If we try hard enough, we'll show it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel sorry for them. I do. Because I think they are throttling their imagination. I think they are shutting themselves off themselves off from the beautiful Greek and Roman poetry that early Christians would have known and would have valued 
and wanted to transform in order to establish their own um, uh, cultural identity and religious identity. I think they are captive, Derek, to a certain kind of orthodoxy and religious uh, constraint that makes them anti-intellectual intellectuals, and I feel sorry for them. It's actually ironic in my view that the gospel authors themselves are apologists in a way. They are trying to make a case for an alternative mythology to the mythologies around them to support the community. And apologists are trying to do that for the Christian community. So the, uh, both of them are apologists in a way. But the apologists look at the Gospels and unless they are entirely historical reliable, they're not meaningful. They're not important. Well, that is a standard I don't think that we can give to anything. That it has to be absolutely pure and, and uh, factual in order to be meaningful. I'm, I'm with you. I think there's something powerful about these being literary devices and not necessarily arguing for the historical or historiological. It, they're dying on that hill and you can see, I think, the reason that they're fighting against their own in the minimalist you know, approach is because they feel that the minimalist, who I think are being more honest, okay, so this is the difference. The minimalists who are still trying to hold on and fight grant their problems that they don't accept things being all historical, like the guards of the tomb in Matthew, for example. They look at that and go, mm, even the Mike Lacona and, and the conservative Christians who are not on their maximalist team will say some of this problem, you know, I don't know if that really happened. Okay, honesty. I respect giving some ground because it's more honest. What these um, apologists will do is find a way to make that actually historical. And, and I've noticed this online. And there may be examples where people m mischaracterize their what's called undesigned coincidences. But I just think it's really odd. You know when you, you're arguing against someone, but like they always have to say how you just don't understand, or you never represent their position, you don't understand the position. And I don't know how they're not seeing what I'm saying, but they, they'll say stuff like in one of the gospels, you have these people go 5,000 being fed. The grass was green. This detail pops yeah, up, yeah. just subtle. And then all of a sudden, another gospel, it does not mention the grass was green at all. It mentions it happened in spring. Oh, okay. So that to them somehow signals as like mundane information like that helps solidify the historiography of it, that it makes it more realistic to them. Yeah. And they call that what's called an undesigned coincidence. And they go endlessly into examples where they think that's the case. And for me, I start at the outset very cautious going, how is something undesigned when we know that they know and are using the literature to craft their own narratives? Yeah. How can you factor that as undesigned? Right. Is there a way to do that? No. I, I wouldn't think it is. <laughs> no, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. I just, so we're going to have to do a review picking the things apart and like helping educate people. Because I think... You know, while we typically wouldn't want to engage with serious scholarship, as Richard C. Miller says, uh, he said, they don't know who these people are, and they probably don't want to know who these people are, because to them, it is anti-intellectual intellectuals. And that is not their pursuit. That's why they don't engage. But we're fighting. There's a, there's a battle going on on the internet, and it's not just them. I don't want to just pick on them. It is the the world of misinformation that goes on TikTok and all of this nonsense that goes on out there. And this particular one, they're trying to drive home heaven and hell, belief in Jesus, damnation of your soul. Like they're really pushing this idea that God is here to save everybody. They believe that this is literally true, just like I once did. And so I'm interested in relieving people like they have a headache. Here's a Tylenol. And give them, hey, don't hate it. Don't hate the material. Take it back. Don't let these people monopolize it. That's exactly it. right. You know? That's exactly right. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah.